This is a podcast recording for Pixel Smith Studios. We're interviewing Christy DeToy, a comic book artist who's quite uh, quite talented in the work that he's done. And recently I found him online because of work he's done in his personal capacity by illustrating mushroom characters. And once you see these mushroom characters, you'll understand why they're so amazing. Uh, not only that, he has a, a photo uh, Affinity Photo Brush Set that you can purchase on the Affinity Store. We will be providing the link to that a bit later, and we will be touching on it in this interview, as that was one of the biggest points why we contacted Christy for this interview, as well as then, of course, the amazing work that he does. So, Christy, um, how would you describe what you do to someone on the street that don't really understand what a comic artist or an illustrator does. So how would you describe your role to that person? Well, hi, um, first and foremost, thank you very much for having me on. Um, that is uh, a, a question that I get very often. I find that a lot of people don't really know what um, the illustration job is. I, I feel like I kind of take it for granted because it's what I do every day. But um, to the general public, it can be quite a mysterious uh, career path. <laughs> so um, just to clear one thing up, I'm not actually a comic book artist myself. I'm like a huge comic enthusiast, but I've never actually worked on comics. That being said, I do work a lot in like a comic-esque sort of art style. So um, what I tell people when they ask me like, okay, so what is an illustrator? What do you do? Is um, basically my job is to find a visual solution for a creative problem. So uh, to give an example of what I mean by that, um, a client can approach me with a, a creative brief which uh, could be something like we need uh, interesting designs for our t-shirts as an apparel company um, and we really like working with the theme of i don't know skulls <laughs> or something um, but we want to make it really interesting and then my job is to take that sort of overview of the project and just find the most visually appealing way that still works with that company's sort of image in the market uh, and then uh, we kind of chip away at it until it's done. And uh, that type of client can vary wildly. I've done stuff for children's books. I've done stuff for skateboards. I've done stuff for apparel, obviously, and advertising. And uh, so the themes can vary quite a lot. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, if I had to summarize it, I pretty much just draw pictures. <laughs> with, with that being said, it reminds me of a, a, a comment I made once to someone who asked me about drawing and making a living off drawing and then the answer was basically a, a different version of what you said where illustration is a medium of solving a problem uh, the actual uh, the actual component of doing the illustration is just one piece of a bigger commercial or personal objective so if it's for a commercial then you would use it for companies, like you said, for apparel or skateboards. Or if you were to in a corporate environment, you would use it for storyboarding or um, animatics and so forth. Would you would you agree with something like that? Yeah, absolutely. And I would go further um, to say that I think uh, when a lot of people think of illustration um, or graphic design or anything like that, they really just think about that end result. But I would say probably 70% of that project is not even working on that end result. It's doing all the planning and thinking ahead of time just to make sure that what you actually end up drawing or designing really answers that creative uh, problem in the best way. I, mean, I really feel like um, almost disingenuous because the people that, let's say, follow me on Instagram always only see that final product. But there's so much that goes into that before I get to that final product that they don't end up seeing. I should actually be posting more of that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. So then how would you say you found your your way from, from where you started out and discovering that you like to draw, you like to illustrate, to where you are now, where you are able to earn a living from using your art as an income stream? So it's been a, quite a wild ride. Um, <laughs> I've been drawing for as long as I can remember. And it's sort of one of the few things that have just really gripped me uh, in a way that I can just 
feel like I could sit in a room and just draw all day for as long as I as long as I have. Like I, I could draw all day every day forever. Um, and it wasn't until I was about a teenager where I sort of started taking it a bit more seriously. Um, and it was because I played in a pretty bad like band, <laughs> rock band, as like most teenagers do, or at least uh, my friends. And um, we needed some album artwork for that. So that put me in a position where I actually had to like learn how to use certain creative softwares to um, accomplish that kind of work. And I didn't know what I was doing at all, but it kind of grabbed me and it became like almost an obsession to just understand that software. And um, through researching the software, I found out a lot about like the industry and stuff around it. And uh, pretty much from there, I realized like I could do this and this is actually something I could do for a living. So I put a lot of effort into studying for my art and design exams in high school. And then afterwards, I went and studied graphic design, ended up working at an illustration studio and uh, then freelancing afterwards. And I've been working for myself now for about six years, I think. Wow. That's, that's the story. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> now, you mentioned working for yourself. Uh, it reminds me, um, you recently online, it was a post I followed as well about your cat. Um, so <laughs> does, your, does your cat also come while you're working and sit on your hardware and like, no, you have to take a break now or like, you're yeah. tired, I'll come give you purse. Yeah, absolutely. We've got three cats <laughs> and a dog. So um, it's it's pretty busy. I was actually a bit worried about our dog's got this new thing that he does where if he wants to play, he'll run to me while I'm working and start barking at me. Okay. And uh, <laughs> this is something I picked up in the last few days. So before doing this uh, call, I just try to run around with them outside so much to tire him out to hope that he doesn't end up doing that. But yet my cats are on my desk. They steal my chair all day long. They uh, <laughs> walk all over my keyboard as cats do. So um, no stranger to the animal craziness. Yeah, we, we love them. I actually got my cat that jumped up on my lap now because, and then that reminded me as well when you said working at home and then I've got my cat sitting here on my lap. Um, right, I heard the meowing and I was like, I think that that's our cat and I almost had to be like, you just, just give me a minute, I've got to go and see what my cat's <laughs> no, it was It was my cat looking for someone because um, my, my fiance left the room and she thought there was okay. no one else in the room. But if she starts meowing again just now, I'll just have to quickly get up to go open the door. Um, that's all good. I totally get it. <laughs> so then, um, during your journey with having found your way to where you are now, uh, has there ever been a, a time where you just encountered a severe drop, maybe as in a insane case of imposter syndrome or artist block where you just wanted to give up? And how did you get over that obstacle? That, yes, absolutely. And um, that's something that happens to me probably at least once a year or maybe twice a year where there's just a month or two months where things just go completely wrong. And uh, that could manifest as like artist block or maybe there's just not, not work, like uh, especially with the pandemic, there's been a lot of like very dry months and that can really get you down. Um, so what I often end up doing is um, obviously different solutions for different scenarios, but I do always find that taking a step back from the work, sort of trying to find out what made me love doing the work in the first place and then trying to channel that into a personal project has always been a really great way for me to just kind of snap out of the funk you know there's sometimes uh, client projects that can be very stressful sometimes they don't really go the way that you want them to go and for stuff like that having a personal project on the side where you can really be in charge of all the decisions you're making you can do whatever you want and really sort of create something that reflects your own personal interests and stuff. Such a great thing to do. Like if, if you get stuck working on like a very corporate project where like, let's say all of the, the clients are kind of micromanaging every aspect and you feel like you just don't really have a creative voice. That's sort of the time where I start going, you know what, I really want to do a skateboard. So I'll just do that on the side. <laughs> and uh, that's really just always been a way for me to sort of remind myself why I like doing the work that I do. And, uh, um, that often channels back into the, the client work as well, just because mm -hmm. I've sort of reignited that flame a little bit, if you could put it that way. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. No, I understand that. 
Yeah, and for creative block, here's just a pro tip for everyone. Just do something different. Like, just try something different. If you're, uh, if, if you want to go for a walk or if you're able to take a day off, that's great. But if not, just try and work in a slightly different way. Just like if you're used to working in pencil, start working in pen. If you're used to working in a digital format, maybe try acrylic or oil paints or something. Sometimes just doing those little things just really helps to sort of spark new ideas and new approaches that kind of inform the rest of your work. That's really been a very helpful thing for me. Mm. No, that's, that's pretty cool. That answers one of the other questions I was going to ask you, but later down the line of, um, what what would you say is one of your best tips for breaking away, unplugging, and recharging? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna let the cat out quickly. I think she wants to go outside. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, back to back to the, the questions. So, <laughs> you know, there's this whole um, debate with pizza around pineapple. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say is your take on pineapple on pizza? Um, my take's probably going to offend a lot of people, and uh, let's hope it doesn't. Uh, wine <laughs> is my favorite pizza. <laughs> so I'm very much for pineapple on pizza and I know it's not super traditional or anything it's definitely not like proper Italian pizza but um, whatever floats your boat like I don't like banana on, uh, on pizza but I know a hell of a lot of people that do and they can absolutely go ahead like if that's their thing I'm all for it that's all it's all good I'm not gonna judge someone on what they like to do yeah <laughs> I, I also quite like uh, pineapple on pizza and then there's another one that I like um it's got rocket, fig jam, and blue cheese. It's okay. really, it's, uh, it's really bizarre combination, but it's really nice. It's it's got this mix of like the 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 um taste of the blue cheese that mixes with the sweetness from the fig jam, and then you just have like that experience. But um, I don't know how the proper pineapple people will feel about that one. Right. <laughs> um, well, as a, as a proper pineapple pizza person, I can say that the only issue I have with that is that I can't stand blue cheese. So it's got nothing to do with the combo of flavors. Yeah, yeah. It's just the ingredients. So, but hey, like I said, if that's what you're into, mm. you do. You. Go yeah. Ahead. <laughs> yeah, blue cheese is a it is a acquired taste of sorts. Um, I, yeah. I actually didn't yeah. like it the first time I had it, but then the, around the second or third time we were in high school and I was the only um, boy in my class for home economics. And then the teacher oh, yeah. did a I was just home economics. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't want to do woodwork because I didn't play rugby and I didn't feel up to the, the behavior of the rugby kids at that time. And for sure. I was very happy that I didn't do woodwork, but in hindsight, I should have at least picked up a few woodwork lessons because now, now I, what if I want to build my own custom desk? Well, luckily, they should. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. For sure. But so, uh, geez, woodwork tools are so expensive. I've like, looked at it before to, uh, to build, actually, like you said, like to build a custom desk for myself. Yeah, it's going to have to uh, be put on the back burner for a while. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, I think if, I, if we manage to find a good carpenter, pay for the wood and just pay them for labor it'll cost about the same as buying all the tools yeah or just buying a nice desk <laughs> or that but we're, we're artists we're difficult yeah <laughs> no, I, I completely hear you i like making something being able to use it i think one of my dreams is to to make a mechanical pencil from the ground up like one day maybe that's Let's that see. would be insane do you also use the two mole one or the normal 0 0.5 one um, I'm pretty indecisive, so I always carry all of them. I've got a two mole, I've got a seven mole, a uh, five, a uh, point three. I've got all kinds of different shapes and sizes, but I will say that um, my my go-to is is actually the the two mole. It's a good one. 
Feels like a normal person, but it's better. <laughs> yeah, I've got two two mils, and then I've also got a one of those precision erasers with the two point three mil oh, yes. eraser thing. It works. Yeah. This. That's the the mono uh, Tombow mono. Uh, yeah, the Tombow mono zero. Yes, they're awesome. They're really really nice. That's, That's one as well. It's my favorite eraser. Um, yeah. So sorry, I just uh, got completely sidetracked there with talking about the cat and then jumping back. But I guess that's what makes conversation so much fun and we're not doing a yeah. full-on Q&A thing. Um, but though, with but getting back to the, the uh, doing something different to recharge and also taking care of yourself if you can take a day off or stuff like that, uh, what would you say is your favorite way of finding creative inspiration to, when you need to take on a project and you're looking for references or ideas on how to approach your uh, brief? I would say that most people will probably answer that question by saying that they will go onto the internet and just look for references or go onto Instagram or Pinterest or wherever. Um, and I certainly do that and have done that for years and years. But more recently, I found that going onto something like Instagram is like disheartening. It's, it's so intimidating because there's so many amazing artists on there and just seeing all of that crazy work, it uh, can be like um, kind of a, a pretty intimidating and it kind of can cause me to shut down a little bit sometimes because I'm like, I'm here to be inspired and I'm leaving like drained <laughs> because I just feel like, um, I don't know, maybe that's an imposter, uh, imposter syndrome sort of thing i just feel like damn these people are so good like will i ever be that good so what i've done more recently is i've taken a step away when it comes to inspiration and i've got a pretty healthy collection of art books that i've collected for the last 10 years or so and uh, i find picking up those books it's it's often like the art of you know insert game or movie title mm -hmm. or, game or whatever um those books help me to sort of more to be more focused with where I'm getting inspiration from and for me to be able to or for me to end up buying that specific book means I must be like a really big fan of that subject matter or that artist and um, I find that it, it sort of eliminates the clutter of like create it's just all like the, the posts that you end up scrolling through and just getting lost in and just keeps me focused on the project and um, yeah I just find that my my book collection has been probably my biggest source of like go-to uh, inspiration and reference for projects, especially in the last year or so. Yeah, you, you can never have too many books. Uh, mm -hmm. Like Completely books, agree. One, of the, one of the examples of books that I've started on recently is graphic novels. I, oh, I, yes. uh, I ordered Harleen by Stepan Sejic. And yeah. then I got the hardcover and it arrived and I'm just like, I need more of this man's books because his yeah. art is amazing. But now with that being said, um, who would you say has been the biggest influence? It doesn't have to be one person, it can be multiple artists, but who's been the biggest influences on your style specifically? Um, it's funny that you mentioned the, the comic book thing because I'm, I'm pretty sure one of my top five influences or inspirations has been um, actually Pepe Larraz, uh, who's a, an illustrator for Marvel. And he did a, a whole newish X-Men series, uh, House of X. And I just also, I bought the first issue and then I was just like, I have to get all of these. <laughs> and his art style is just insanely, insanely good. Um, but aside from him, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because I find that my like inspirations or influences can be pretty varied and pretty scattered. So instead of like me specific names um i would rather say that like as a broad thing i'm very inspired by comic books i'm very inspired by especially like 80s sort of skateboard graphics and like apparel designs which is just like crazy monsters with like eyes popping up and like <laughs> multicolor. um i find that graffiti is quite cool as well because it's got incredible um, color choices like very vibrant very interesting colors and um also, um, industrial design, which is kind of like 
uh, an odd uh, odd point to bring up, but like I've been incredibly inspired by industrial design sketches recently. Um, there's such a focus on like uh, construction and um, just like visual appeal because all of these products that these designers are creating and sketching out, one of the most important aspects of those products is they have to look good for the consumers. And I'm always trying to find like, how can I apply those same principles to something like illustration? Um, mm -hmm. So industrial design has been like a really big inspiration in general, you know, it's not specific names or stuff. For specific names, if I could like just list them right now, probably biggest inspirations right now, Pepe Rose, um, Preacher Box, uh, character design studio mm -hmm. and uh you know what that's probably it right now those are my two really big inspirations i've just been obsessing over those people's work for the last few months actually i, I can i can understand that it's like when i when i first started with um trying to learn to draw and picked up different art styles this was when my anatomy knowledge was still basically non-existent you know when you look at an artist's work and you copy what that artist did but you don't know why they uh, warped or distorted the anatomy in the way they did you just thought it looks cool yeah. to copy it um one of the artists i picked up at that time was joe madureira oh um, he's amazing yeah battle chases yeah until today i still can't get over this guy's art style i was so happy when um when i saw with the darksiders franchise how, how yeah. this work came to life and then when uh, I'm not sure if it's if he was still involved with with the franchise when THQ Nordic took over, but um, that was one of the highlights for me when I was uh, learning about art and stuff. And until today, it's still a big learning learning curve. Uh, yeah. I don't know about you, but what what would you say is the biggest and most important? discipline that anyone in the creative field has to develop if they want to make a success of themselves where so the term success is used very arbitrarily um someone might think it's money others might think it's having a portfolio that's well known but um regardless of what their term of success is what would you say is the biggest discipline that has helped you to get where you are now and that is that you fall back on quite often to help you through when you really need to push a deadline or you really need to get a project done? I would say probably I have this idea in mind always that I'm like, I will forever be a student, you know, and maybe not like in my professional work, but just like um, in, in general, I never put a cap on where I'm going to stop learning new tricks or techniques. So even though I'm like, quote unquote, like a working illustrator, um, or working professional, whatever you want to say. Um, I very much feel like there's so much to learn and I always try and approach that stuff like a sponge. Like I'm always just looking for new tricks and new techniques and places where I need more um, experience and then kind of finding tutorials, finding books on the subject and kind of really working on that. So I think the biggest thing for me has just been that like willingness and openness to, to learn. Um, mm -hmm. I find that there are certain people who get to a certain point in their style or in their work and they're just like, I'm happy with that. And then they just stagnate <laughs> and you can look at their work 10 years later and it still looks the same. And I just could never do that. Like even my work from, I think two years ago, looks so much different to my work now. And mm -hmm. I think that's just like an actual evolution of the work, but to me, it keeps it interesting. And it also gives me a platform to constantly be sort of growing and evolving and um working on sort of my skills wherever i get a chance and i think that's been a really crucial aspect uh, for just general improvements and mm -hmm. yeah that, that, that was it to me yeah i would i would highly say that's that's accurate uh, especially for myself as well it's like the work i did a, a year ago or two years ago even though the the topics of things i'm still working on is very much the same the, the methods yeah. and the output is very different um, but apart from that, with always changing the, the art style or changing the, the way you work, it also links back to some of the equipment we sometimes use, uh, which is the next part of this interview is about the um, affinity, which we linked at the start of the, at the course, I uh, had the, the right. podcast. Um, I was, I was quite interesting when I, when, when we first touched on the, the brush pack that you have on the affinity store, 
um, but uh, how how did that happen? That you found affinity, and then uh, did they contact you? Did you pre present the work, the brush back to them, or did they see your work and then they saw you were using their software, and then they asked if you would like to enter into a partnership? It was like just one of those at the right place at the right time moments. Yeah, it was. Um, it's a bit of a funny story, actually. Um, and uh, I hope Affinity doesn't mind me saying this. The first time I used Affinity Designer, I didn't like it. <laughs> and I was quite vocal about it on, on Instagram. And I actually tagged them and I said, like, oh, I'm trying out using Affinity Designer. I'm not sure how it's going to go. And then I was like, you know what? I actually don't think I like the software. I've kind of given it the chance. And then Affinity saw the post. And uh, that was a few years ago. So their Instagram was quite a lot smaller and it was a lot easier to reach them with, uh, if you had to like tag them or something, I think they've grown up quite a lot on there. But anyway, um, they contacted me and they said, well, look, we're, we're sorry that you aren't like enjoying the software, but, but like, what do you think we can do to improve? And then we started talking a little bit and, uh, then they ended up actually hiring me to create a project using designer. Uh, to and I, I don't know their reasoning for the, for hiring someone who actually said they don't like the software, but through that process, I actually for the first time was put in a position where I really had to learn how to use the software properly because I was using it for a paid client job, and I fell in love with the software and I was like, you know what, everything, all my reservations that I had about the software in the past are gone now, and uh, I think I just needed like a reason to really learn how to use it. I think that's probably most people's issue with uh, switching from something like Adobe. Yeah. It's and just that learning curve. That it's kind of a, a big one. But anyway, yeah. so that was just the beginning of my relationship with Affinity. But from the get-go, I realized that one thing I was missing was all my brushes that I used to use in Photoshop. And I had such a big collection of brushes that I couldn't use in Affinity. So I did a bit of research and I decided, you know what, I'm going to make my own brushes and I'll just see how it goes. And for quite a few projects, I was put in a position where I had to create a custom brush that Affinity didn't have as one of the stock brushes. And uh, it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And because a lot of my work has sort of a bit of a comic book style, a lot of the brushes that I created kind of followed that style of work so uh, it became like almost like a set of comic book tools but in a digital version but all based on like very traditional stuff you know pencils inks and effects and all that kind of stuff splatters, mm -hmm. splatters. and um i was thinking about maybe selling it but i posted on instagram i was like i might sell this i don't know who's interested in stuff and affinity saw the post and they were like Listen, and at that stage, we had already like established quite a good like working relationship because I've worked on three projects for them at this stage, which is quite nice. So they were like, well, listen, we're looking for new content for our store. Why don't you sell the brushes through our store? And mm -hmm. um, that was uh, something that I had not considered at all. And uh, it was actually quite stressful. It was the first time that I'd ever created like a proper brush pack. Uh, to be sold, um, but it's worked out really well. It's actually been really exciting and I often get emails and messages from people who seem to be enjoying the brushes. So it's just been a huge compliment to know that my little brushes that were never intended to be sold <laughs> actually ended up being like quite a nice, uh, nice talking point, I guess, when, as far as like affinity and my relationship mm. is concerned. Yeah. Your whole story now would make anyone in marketing give uh, who were, would have been in, um, who would have been involved with this relationship building that you have with affinity uh, they would give themselves a pat on the back now because they, <laughs> the, the big reason for the hire was to try and win you over and it was yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it that was it it's like because in digital marketing, and this is now my digital marketing side kicking in because I work in corporate um, in sure. a, a digital marketing team. Uh, Pixel Smith Studios is uh, a sideline gig for me. It's not my full-time job. Um, oh. But doing creative for marketing, it's always the biggest challenge that we always try and accomplish is to get 
people who see products or offerings in negative light to convert them yeah. over into someone who becomes a brand ambassador. And essentially that is the relationship that you and Affinity have now built is you are basically a brand ambassador for them. And yeah, I guess so then. Yeah, and the, the, the good things you have said about them, about how they handled your uh, criticism, which was taken on and was converted into constructive criticism with conversations, and then that criticism being onboarded, onboarded into a solution. That is a marketing achievement. That is like when th that's when the marketers go achievement unlocked, done. <laughs> we can go celebrate. For sure. <laughs> yeah, so, no, it's, it's been a cool journey with Infinity so far. And uh, I don't know, just seeing like um, the new features and, and things that they've been implementing into the apps and mm -hmm. just how fast they've been growing. And it's yeah. been really cool to see like someone who I feel is really like a very worthy, probably the first very worthy competitor to like Adobe's big three, you know, the, the Photoshop, Illustrator, and design sort of career. Uh, and I feel like a lot of people can pretty easily, you know, if you're willing to put up with a little bit of a learning curve, um, yeah. seamlessly switch over to, uh, to using Affinity without any major drawbacks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've been, I've been using it for, for my client work now for, geez, I want to say almost three years. It's crazy. It doesn't feel that long, but um, yeah, I've had no major issues. Uh, it's yeah. been pretty much smooth sailing since uh, since they hooked me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the features that actually convinced me that I need to use the Affinity Suite uh, is for my personal work as well. Is the brush smoothing that they have because they have the pulled line, and then they yes. have the window tool. So those yes. two smoothing options for me is amazing, especially when I do inking. Uh, so when I'm not yeah. when I'm not smoothing in Clip Studio with Lazy Nazumi, and if I'm in Affinity, then I just use Affinity's built-in um, stabilizers, yeah. and it's wonderful. It's like insert chef's kiss. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And uh, I will say one of probably one of the biggest advantages that Affinity has is the iPad versions of their apps. Are almost exactly the same as the desktop versions. They've, they're in, the interface is different, but the, mm -hmm. uh, the functionality is almost exactly the same. And I mean, even with Adobe, like I think Adobe's got like a Photoshop now for iPad, but it kind of sucks. <laughs> Where like with Affinity, like the, the apps from day one pretty much have been like seamlessly compatible between desktop and iPad. So it's yeah, really yeah. easy to work on something and then. I don't know, load shedding happens or you, or I have to run out or I just feel like going to a coffee shop or something. I literally just drop the, the file on Dropbox and I'm good to go. You know, there's no, no weird like file conversion necessary or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can understand that. It's, it's the, um, what was it called? The, the ecosystem is, is yes. important that that yeah. works. Uh, but now, Apart from having spoken about tools and about influences and about all of the, the growth we've been discussing, uh, I just want to come back to the, to the art topics we were talking about earlier. One of the questions that popped into my head now is, um, if, what is one piece of advice that you would give to uh, aspiring creatives about handling constructive criticism? Because th your story now with Affinity reminded me that this was for me personally, this was a big thing I had to get used to because I didn't have a formal uh, education in creativity. I had one year in learning how to use a 3D tool and then we learned how to do 3D in that year, but everything creatively that I know and that I've been doing over the last eight or nine years in my career has been self-taught um, through yeah. YouTube videos, through listening to other people, asking people for help and advice. Um, but along with that, I never got the concept of constructive criticism early on. So I yeah. did have a bit of an ego going into the industry three, four years after I started thinking I know quite a bit, but then I got humbled quite quickly and I'm very happy yeah. that I did get humbled, but also the experience as uncomfortable as it was, it was an important one. And I was, I was thinking that would be a good question to ask you is like, 
advice on handling constructive criticism early on in your creative journey? I, it is a tricky one for a lot of people uh, and it doesn't always get easier <laughs> because when someone tells you that something that you've done isn't right, it can sometimes feel like a bit of a personal attack, but I think the quicker you realize, you know, they're not attacking you, they're just uh, being honest with you. And that's actually really um, a big advantage is to get fresh eyes on your work and for people to make suggestions. I think, uh, you know, just realizing that those people are trying to help really helps with uh, dealing with the constructive criticism. And I certainly went into college like quite uh, with a bit of an ego as well, because I took a gap year after high school and I pretty much spent the whole year just learning how Photoshop and Illustrator and stuff works and kind of studying the programs inside and out. So by the time I got into college, I felt like I was really qualified, which is the biggest lie I've ever told myself. So I was definitely a bit big headed in college, but um, I was very humbled uh, when I graduated and I went to work for a studio that had like professionals there with like like seasoned professionals that really knew what they were talking about and I quickly realized like I'm actually at the bottom of the food chain but um I'm fortunate in that I studied um at an advertising college and if you've ever gotten constructive criticism while working on an ad job then you know what harsh criticism is like it's not unheard of for people to be like I hate this I don't know what you're thinking yeah. Um, so one of the first lessons they told us in first year is like uh, they pretty much started like tearing up our projects and they were like, um, like this all sucks. <laughs> and we actually learned like, okay, you know, this is just sort of how it is. Um, but at the same time, you know, realizing that if you get, I don't know, builders in to do renovations at your house and you're not happy with how it's done, like surely you would say something. And uh, it's just the same thing, you know, it just is how it is. It's, it's mm. not that they don't like you as a person, or they think that your work isn't good. It's just maybe it didn't quite go according to plan. So yeah. when you realize that and you kind of make peace with that emotionally and mentally, it does get a little bit easier, but it, it's not, it, I mean, it can be pretty hectic sometimes also. Yeah, the funniest uh, feedback I got once was an art director asking me, would you be offended if I told you I didn't like it? And I was just like, okay. <laughs> We're in a digital advertising agency. Um, asking me if I'll be offended is strange. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't, I, I don't care if, if you offend my feelings, it's about the work. <laughs> it's not about <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I completely hear you. But I think we actually, uh, we got quite a bit of, topics that we discussed and I think we actually had got a really nice ending there with a little bit of a bringing down the conversation and ending it off with the handling the constructive criticism. Um, yeah. I've got one last question for you though. If anyone would like to find you online, uh, what are the platforms they can find you on where they can see you quite actively posting when you do post and when you do take time away to update your socials? Um, so probably my most used or most up-to-date one is Instagram, as with a lot of people. Um, also, Behance or Behance or however you'd like to pronounce that. I've heard many different pronunciations. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on there as well. That's probably my main sort of uh, professional portfolio, even though it's slightly mm -hmm. outdated. Mm -hmm. But um, I've, I've used Facebook. Facebook's kind of fading away a little bit. I don't really use it as much anymore. Um, so yeah, it's mostly Instagram and Behance and it's just Christy Detoy. It's uh, Christy with an I at the end, not an I, E or a Y. <laughs> and uh, Detoy is uh, D-U space T-O-I-T. Cool. That's, <laughs> a, that, that's awesome. And then also a shameless punt incoming, but um, on our platform, we recently launched our digital marketplace and I was quite excited about it. So when I spoke to to you about this whole uh, interview, I actually asked you to go make an account. And so what you got, what you guys can also do is in the future, as uh, Christie's content grows, uh, you can go find some of his items that he might be putting up every now and then say he's drawn uh, one of his characters or he's created a new asset, then you might just see it on that store. Otherwise, 
go check him out on Gumroad. Uh, he's got a store there as well. And I'm actually going to go head over there and see if I can buy anything for myself. <laughs> but um, <Thank> you. <laughs> yeah, with that being said, Christy, thank you for giving us time and letting us interview you. It's been great talking to you. Um, thank you for having me. It's, it's been it's, it's really been one of my more fun uh, conversations to have. It, I think it's more because I've been doing this a little bit more now. I'm starting to get used to talking to people over a microphone. But other right. than that, <laughs> um, have a good one. And then we'll, we'll catch you around. And then keep on creating the awesome work. And then, yeah, once this is live, I'll also send you the, the updates. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. And... Uh, yeah, it's been awesome, uh, awesome chatting, catching up, and just going through all this stuff. So, yeah, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. All right, cool. Thanks, dude. Bye bye. All right, man. Cheers.